Next on BBC News is Hard Talk. Welcome to Hard Talk. I'm Stephen Sacker. Vladimir Putin has wrong-footed the West again. First it was in Crimea and eastern Ukraine. Now it's with his rapidly escalating military intervention in Syria. The Obama administration, NATO and the EU have issued warnings and condemnations. But does the West have a coherent strategy in Syria? Does the EU have a security strategy at all? Well, my guest is German Defence Minister Ursula von der Leyen. Is Europe serious about defence? Ursula von der Leyen, welcome to Hard Talk. Thank you. Let's start with the situation in Syria right now. How alarmed are you by what the Russians are doing in Syria? Well, uh, it needs a lot of attention because uh, the Kremlin is kind of getting into the game with a lot of show of strength. Um, but um, if you just stand aside a little bit and watch that whole scene, what we do know is that none of the acting powers at the moment being in Syria, Iraq, will make a change on its own. So over the time, they will have to sit down at the negotiating table too to find out whom to fight and whom to protect. Mm. German intelligence is renowned throughout the world for being pretty efficient. And you in your government have traditionally had quite a good communications line with Moscow. Were you completely taken by surprise by the scale of the military intervention made by Vladimir Putin? Well, we were not surprised anymore after what we have seen over months in the eastern Ukraine, where we saw um, how the choreography of a hybrid warfare was. And uh, therefore, you should never underestimate the Russian president and the Kremlin. But on the other hand, um, we also know that uh, Russia is in a situation where they also fear uh, what, uh, what ISIS is doing, and they really fear the threat of foreign fighters. Though they have um, an interest to get into the game in Syria and Iraq, not only because of Assad, but also because of ISIS. Well, of course, the Russians say that they are hitting ISIS targets, Islamic State targets, but the Americans say that all the intelligence that they are getting suggests that the majority of Russian military activity is actually targeting other opponents of Assad because, as far as the Americans are concerned, Putin's prime objective is to shore up Assad's regime. Is that the way you see it? Well, he has a strong interest in uh, stabilizing Assad's regime. That is absolutely true. Although you should not forget that Putin himself said um, that the long-term solution might be without Assad, which is a lot, uh, if uh, Russia says so. But you, you don't um, but really yes. believe that, do you? I mean, he's got, he's got huge amount of military personnel, of warplanes, of cruise missiles being launched from the Caspian Sea, all right now helping Assad try to win back territory. It's quite clear what Russia's game is. Russia's game is to uh, make sure that they have their bases in Latakia, make sure that they have their military present. They need uh, the harbour of Latakia. And, uh, of course, then make sure that the regime, Assad, uh, will not crumble. But um, whether it has to be in the future with the person, Assad, or not, so far Russia left it open. We should not underestimate it, as I said, and take that very serious. But uh, what I want to emphasize is that we should not lose focus together that all of us have an interest to fight ISIS. ISIS is the real danger. And therefore, at the very end, there is an interest for Russia to come back into the game, to sit down at the international table, to be a player in the game. And uh, what Russia does well, at the moment being is show uh, that they want to be at the same yes. level. Well, with frankly, strength. Minister, he's not just a player in the game. Right yeah. now, Vladimir Putin is running the game. I mean, he, to quote one senior British politician, is running rings around the Western powers, including NATO members, including the United States, including, I would say, Germany too. Would you accept that? Well, he, no, um, I wouldn't put it that way because on the long term, he will not be able to be a game changer within Syria, Iraq, um, because uh, they, for that, he would need um, the whole region 
to work with him and he doesn't have the region. Of course, there are close bonds to Iran. Uh, he does establish uh, links to the Iraq government. But uh, if you really want to, if we want to make a change there and if we really serious want to fight ISIS, which we all have to do, it will take us years to fight ISIS, the phenomenon of ISIS, then the whole Muslim Arab world, the Gulf states, Iran, Turkey, Russia, the European Union, uh, the United States, we all have to sit together and decide about the minimal consensus whom to fight and whom to protect. Come on then, tell me, what you've just been at a NATO ministers meeting and you're having more talks, I know, with top officials in the UK, the US. What are you proposing to do? The thing about Putin is he acts decisively. So what is the decisive action that we can look for from your government and other members of the Western Alliance? Well, um, I would not underestimate what uh, we've achieved so far. Um, I remember in, one... In Syria? In, in Syria and Iraq. It's the Levant. Well, what it's, it's Syria and Iraq. Have, the, have the Western is... powers achieved? Well, yes, I remember one year ago, uh, ISIS was slaughtering the Jizids and just running over the north of Iraq, kind of chasing uh, ahead of them uh, the Kurdish Peshmerga. This has changed. We were able um, to stabilize the Peshmerga. They are very motivated and they are brave. They showed that uh, ISIS can be beaten. They fought them back. They are protecting the Jizidis in their part of the country. They established again their government uh, in place. So. Um, they showed that ISIS is not unbeatable. Well, uh, I'm just wondering about some specific things. Why, if you are so convinced that IS is the problem and that IS has to be front and centre of any Western approach to Syria, why is your German Air Force not flying sorties over Syria? Well, because there is not a lack of um, airstrikes. You need both. The airstrikes are very helpful, very helpful, specifically at the beginning. But of course, IS did learn from the airstrikes. It's kind of going deep into the population, so it's getting more difficult. And what well, you Vlad do Vladimir need... Vladimir Putin thinks that airstrikes are worth, worth uh, taking on. And so does David Cameron, not, who's now trying to get not, the UK involved. You will not uh, be successful over time, and you will not be able to um, defeat ISIS uh, only by airstrikes. What you need is ground troops, and there it is wise to enable um, the local forces to put them into the position so that they can claim their territory. Right. So you're, I'm sure for, you're not for a minute suggesting that German ground troops are going to be sent to Syria, but are you suggesting that Germany will start to arm the anti-Assad forces in Syria? Well, at the moment being, we are arming since one year the Kurdish... The Kurds? Uh, yeah, the Kurd, the Peshmerga. But I'm talking um, about the Sunni and, opponents well, of Assad who are not yes. the jihadists from IS. Qatar and Saudi Arabia have given strong indications in recent days that because of what Putin is doing, they are going to pour weaponry into Syria. What uh, the alliance against terror should do is not only pour weapons, which is correct, but um, do formation. This is more important. Enable them to really have a strategy to fight ISIS. But, but to be but, clear, Minister, because yeah. these details are important, is Germany now saying we should be arming in a very significant way the anti-Assad forces in Syria who are Sunni Muslim but are not IS? Well, if we put it that way, uh, if you can identify that group, that is the most difficult task to identify them, to find them in large numbers, um, then it would be wise uh, from the, the coalition against terror, the alliance against terror, to put them in the position which is uh, give them arms and give them formation to fight against ISIS. The problem is to identify those groups, to find those people who are neither Assad nor ISIS but the small moderate opposition in between. Isn't the problem here when we talk about Europe's response that as so often in the past, whether it be Afghanistan or Iraq or a whole host of other issues, Europe finds it very difficult to speak with a de decisive voice. The Americans can come up with a position, Vladimir Putin can certainly come up with a position and act, but Europe finds it extraordinarily difficult. Well, it takes always time, that's true, I'm with you, but what I like about Europe is um, that then we are really sustainable and reliable in what we do. But um, we frankly example, don't do very much at all. 
Partly because we don't even have the military capability. Look at Germany, for example. Yes. You know, you, NATO wants every member state to spend at least 2% of national income on defence every year. Well, what is the figure right now in Germany? 1.17%. 1.17%. Yes. You know what well, our problem is? Below. You know what our problem is? It's a strong and rising GDP. That's our problem. I'll tell you something <laughs> else. I'll tell you, I'll tell you what else a, is the problem, a, a lack chance. of political commitment. No, 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 no. We have a rising amount. Um, at the moment, we, next year, we're going to have 35 billion per year investing in our defense budget. There still, still won't be 2% of national income. No, that's true. But I tell you, there are three countries who uh, met last year uh, the 2%, United States, Britain, and, and Greece. Greece. So what does it tell us this? Is the strongest three armies, are they the input for NATO? Is the best one from the United States? I'd say yes. Britain, I'd say yes. Greece? So we should discuss the input for NATO mm. and the output NATO has from the investment. Only to take 2% of the GDP in investment in, uh, in defense does not mean that it is efficient and effective. And therefore, I, I really would uh, ask you to sum up how much Germany does invest in NATO. For example, the well, JTF I, I, now. I, I, I take your point, but I also look at the data and some of the recent experiences. Mm -hmm. Only 24 of 43 of your C-160 transporters were operational last year. 42 of your 103 Eurofighters were actually operational. West Germany used to have an army or military of 500,000. What, what is the total number of military personnel in Germany today? 185,000 soldiers and in total 250,000 yeah, it's, it's less than half and it's what it was matter, in West well, Germany. Yes, but I beg your pardon, it's not only a matter of mass, of quantity. It's a question of quality. So we changed completely mm. the structure over the last 25 years. You are right that after the fall of the Iron Wall, the fall of yeah, uh, the, the Iron Curtain or the Wall, uh, we had a pretty strong decline in defense budget, like almost everybody in Europe, because we were surrounded by friends. But of course we saw last year that we have a total change of security environment and mm. we have to invest and that's what we do. We modernize you, now. Just very quickly, when will you hit the 2% threshold that NATO wants to see? Well, before that, we want the discussion in NATO what the input and the output is per nation. I want to so see you can't, you what can't you tell get. Me when you'll get to two percent? No, because first of all, we want to see uh, what we get, uh, what, what what we put in for the money. If NATO, NATO wants two percent, I would really want the discussion who is putting what in NATO and what is NATO getting out of it. Okay. And therefore, I think they could not. Uh, blame Germany. Just very quickly, I need to talk to you about Ukraine mm -hmm. because uh, it seems to me Germany and France, particularly when uh, Mr. Hollande and Mrs. Merkel met uh, Vladimir Putin just a few days ago in Paris, seem to be sending a signal that, you know, we can live with the status quo, with a sort of frozen conflict in Ukraine because we've got much bigger issues to worry about. Oh, no. Is that the message you're sending? Oh, no. Uh, we have a long-lasting memory and we know about what the violation of international law, law does mean. The annexation of Crimea, the hybrid warfare in eastern Ukraine. We will not forget that. Um, well, you may not forget and, uh, it, but what are you actually doing about well, it? Uh, well, Putin did not, was not able, President Putin was not able to meet his goals in uh, the eastern Ukraine. I think we should not always diminish what we got on our side. And uh, in the eastern Ukraine, uh, there was the question, should we answer in the same way as uh, the Kremlin was interacting in eastern Ukraine? That would has, uh, have raised the bloodshed enormously. We decided, and th that's the good part about the story, first of all, we showed that Europe shows unity. I think this is something where the Kremlin, what the Kremlin did not expect to happen, that Europe shows unity. Then we choose an instrument where to hurt Russia, where Russia is the most vulnerable that is in their economy. Mm. Because they did not modernize the economy, because this is risky for them, then they have to open up and globalize. I, I no and, doubt Europe has uh, imposed some economic sanctions, but I'll tell you what I heard in Kiev the other day. I was talking to Prime mm -hmm. Minister Yatsenyuk, and he just expressed grave disappointment that Europe will not consider arming Ukraine with serious, significant defensive weaponry. And he pointed a finger at Germany. He said the Germans just are not interested. Why? Because we do not want um, that we try out what, how high the price is to try to fight the Russian army in Ukraine. Because but then this Putin is not the sees place you as weak. 
No, he does not see us as weak because he did not reach his goals because we imposed sanctions combined with a dropping oil price that helped. We see now that the Russian economy is going down the drain and at the very end you have to pay the bills even for your army. So why answer with an instrument where what, what the hybrid warfare is concerned, where the outcome is unsure and you have an enormous cost of human lives and why not being smarter what we did as Europe answer with the instrument that is effective. Your instruments as you put it yeah. can they get Ukraine reintegrated properly reunited and can they reverse the annexation of Crimea these instruments of yours? On the long term it is must the costs must be extremely high for the Kremlin. Um, to proceed as he did in the eastern Ukraine. And as you see, he did not reach the goals he wanted uh, to reach. And I think in, in security policy and defense policy, we should not only stare on the military solution, sometimes it is necessary, therefore we are engaged in the Iraq, for example, or Afghanistan, we are deeply engaged in Afghanistan. Sometimes um, you need, yes, you need the military instrument, but it just opens the corridor for the mm. most important part, which is the political process and the economic development. And the economic instruments uh, we see in Russia at the moment, Dean, if you have a, a weak economy, you have a problem with your security and defense side. So this is what uh, makes Russia vulnerable at the moment, being that they see they have a dropping economy. He, the, the Kremlin has to change its strategy. Let us now look at another aspect of the huge security challenge facing you, Germany, and indeed all of Europe, and that is securing Europe's borders in the context of the most massive movement of people, migration, since the Second World War. Clearly, Europe's borders are not secure, and every single day as we talk, thousands more uh, asylum seekers are entering Europe from Turkey and elsewhere. How does Germany propose to stop this flow of people? Or are you just intent upon saying we have an open door policy and if you make it, you are welcome in Germany? We're talking about asylum seeker, first of all. And uh, Germany is determined to stick what is the Article 1 in our Constitution that the dignity of a human being is untouchable for us, specifically if you look at our history. And uh, therefore, if you have a reason for asylum, you will get shelter in Germany and in Europe. This is one of our core values. Bilt says that it's seen leaked documents that say the German government now expects up to 1.5 million asylum seekers in your country by the end of the year. Is that right? Um, I'm, I'm not speculate, uh, I'm not going to speculate about the numbers, but the, the, the basic attitude in Germany is that we will not sell our core value. Um, what we've written down in our constitution, we really mean it. Yeah, but and the problem is your the, own the people are having grave is, doubts about the difficult, this. No, the difficult task is that when it's getting concrete <laughs> all of a sudden, whether you stand up for your values or whether you say, oh no, this is too difficult, so we kind of forget about our, our core principles. Well, you and, know, you, uh, you can call it core principles or you can call it something that is unsustainable. Then, I mean, let, let me just, yeah. just make one point to you. Horst Seehofer, the CSU leader uh, in Bavaria, uh, an ally politically of Angela Merkel, says that she has made with this open door policy, quote, a mistake that will cost us for a very long time. And the polls suggest many Germans feel that too. Well, uh, it's not a open, open door policy. It's the principle of asylum seeker get shelter. So that's the first thing. If, if they are real refugees from terror and from civil war, uh, we have um, to take them well, yeah, on. I don't know if you've talked that. to neighbours like the Hungarian uh, well, Foreign Minister Peter well, Seattle, who I spoke to the well, other day, who said Germany has offered itself as a magnet to these people, and that's why they st and still I'm keep coming. I am completely, I have a completely different opinion about that, uh, because whether uh, Angela Merkel would have said that or not, um, the, the refugees came before that sentence already, in thousands and thousands. So it's not one sentence. 
who made people flee terror and war. And I would not overestimate that sentence. I understand uh, that what sentence. you're saying. Yeah, but you, you say it's, it's a principle. principle. Yeah, the principle But, but, but here's the thing. Uh, it's also a question of priorities. The Hungarians told me, look, what Europe must do and must prioritise as number one is securing the borders. If Greece can't patrol effectively its I'm own coastline... You. I'm with you. But securing the border do does it. not mean close the border. It does mean give it an order and be, be um, clear about registration, the refugees, and sending back those who are not refugees and do not have an asylum, reason for asylum. But this will not, um, therefore, you have to address the problem itself and not just say we closed the border, what we could not do rationally. Is it time to review Schengen? from a security point of view, because once these people get into any part of the European Union, as long as they're in a Schengen nation, they can travel anywhere in the European well, Union. I wonder Schengen if you worry about that. Schengen is a name for a mechanism. Schengen is a name for a mechanism. Schengen is not um, a synonym for um, do we accept asylum seekers or not. So Schengen is a mechanism that doesn't work well at all at the moment. And being now at certain, countries at are building places. fences. And yeah. now countries and are questioning. Fences. Fences are not a solution. We cannot build fences in Europe um, because this is not the answer to the problem. We can um, work hard on integrating those who need shelter, work hard on the reasons for uh, why the refugees were fleeing from their countries, go to the uh, refugee camps and put them in a state that is uh, um, worth staying there. Work in Turkey, work in Lebanon, in Jordan, with you. Do you Europe. believe the scale so, of this migration crisis threatens to fundamentally destabilize the European Union? No, I do not think so. I think um, Europe is able to manage that if we really stand together and if we do not only look on our domestic shores, we do have the task we have to tackle, but also go to the, to the source of the problem. Um, look at the refugee camps, look at Syria, Iraq, look at Afghanistan, look at um, Africa, the northern part of Africa. And this is a global task we have to manage and the, we will be able to manage that as uh, a, a united that, Europe, uh, but uh, not as a Europe that builds fences around and thinks then the problem is gone. The problem will not be gone by fences. And a very final point. Here you are in London. You're seeing your counterpart here, <coughs> Michael Fallon. You must have thought long and hard about the implications of a possible British exit from the European Union, not least in security terms. Your finance minister in Germany said that it would be terrible, a disaster for Britain to leave, but it would also be a disaster for the European absolutely, Union. Absolutely, absolutely. So what's Germany... We want you in Europe. What we is Germany need. prepared to offer David Cameron? Well, we sit down and we discuss with him the details. This is not something we're going to... Uh, share here over the table. But the British public um, want to know if he's going to win some serious concessions. Do you think he is? Uh, I'm convinced that if we sit down uh, Europe and uh, the British and uh, talk about the details, we will find a solution because we are highly interested to keep you in Europe. I think it's better for Europe. I think it's better for Great Britain. I think we are relevant together and we can tackle the global problems that are occurring together better than each single nation could ever could on its own. The flip side of what you've just said is that you believe Britain would be irrelevant if it left and any, went on its any own. Any country, I think any country, Germany, would be irrelevant if it just acts on its own. And Britain? Germ I, I can only speak for Germany. So I, I would not never talk about other countries, but it is serious that we really want you in Europe and we uh, are willing to offer and to share a lot with you what your concerns are uh, and find solutions to keep the British in Europe. This is something I think which is a good and old European tradition. Ursula von der Leyen, we have to end there, but thank you very much for being on Hard Talk. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Thank indeed. you. Minister.